Welcome to Coding Accessible Web Forms for Beginners. So forms is something that we all hate, but they are, <laughs> we hate filling them in, but they're very important for conversion, for everything. When you have, a, especially when it comes to static websites, you need people to fill in your forms in order to contact you and buy your services. So basically the form is the heart of a website when the whole point of a website is to make the user contact you. The problem is forms are very often made inaccessible because of lots of um, trends and fads like the evil placeholders. So let's start by seeing how we can mitigate some of those problems. So when it comes to forms, the first thing you wanna know to do is add a heading, a correct heading for your form. And choosing the type of heading you need depends on your page structure. If all you have on a page is one form, then one heading and heading level one is fine. So this is very often just a contact us. Something like this. And this will make, this. the reason we need a heading is because people using screen readers navigate websites via headings. And they also navigate it via landmarks. So if you have something like a section, you need to have a heading in it, some kind of a heading. So if we have, for example, two forms on the site, then you need to enclose them in sections. But if you only have one form on a page, then you don't need to do that. So this is why headings are so important. So the next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna start coding a form. Now that our heading situation is complete, if you have a couple of headings on the site, just enclose them in sections. Okay, make sure you give them headings. If you cannot give them any headings, for example, if your designer is like, no, headings are evil, they're ugly, we don't like headings. Then what you gotta do is you go inside the section and you add a label, and this will serve as your heading. For example, um, get a quote. And this will be more than enough. It's, it's sort of like an invisible heading, okay? So the first thing we wanna do when we code the accessible forms is we need semantic HTML, okay? So to do that, we need to add the form element. And after the form element, what it comes afterwards is you need to label each individual input with a label. Now this is very important because I know a lot of people like to use placeholders. So what you do now is you, you type you, the name of your input. So for example, name, and then, so we have the label name. Okay, and now we're going to write our input and the input is just going to be text, okay? Now, the problem here is that the label isn't connected to the input in any way. Meaning that if I click here, so a test I often conduct with forms to see if they're actually connected to the labels is, I click on the label and if the input isn't focused, that means the label is useless. It's not programmed correctly. So to mitigate that, what you have to do is connect the label to the input and you can do this via several ways. Let's give this an ID of um, name. And then this, let's give this the for attribute name. Now, when we did that, the label connects to the input via its ID. So now when I click on the label name, the input highlights, and this, is, this means that the input is accessible. And that's one way to do it. Another way to do it is to just enclose the input inside the label. And then you don't need a name. You can just delete it. Make sure you, you, you write correct HTML. Because I say not as I do. Okay. And then when you click on it, it highlights. So what I see very often is uh, something like this. Just uh, divs placed next to the to the input fields. And this is really bad because if I click on it, it doesn't highlight, but that's not all. When you are cited, you can see the form, okay? You can see that this input expects a name, but if you're using a screen reader, imagine using a, using a, a web page with the monitor turned off. You can't see anything. You only rely on the screen reader. And when the screen reader goes to this input, it doesn't know that the div is connected to the input because the only way to know that if you connect it semantically with a label. But if it doesn't know that, then the screen when you when the user just 
jumps into the input, the screener is just going to be silent and the user isn't going to know what kind of input it, they're expected to enter. This is why labels are so important. And if you guys use WordPress, I don't know if you use uh, WordPress and if anybody has used contact form seven, by default, contact form seven adds divs or paragraphs instead of labels. So it means it's really inaccessible. If you have contact form seven on your website, go delete it right now because it's, it's terrible. So this is, uh, this is for labels. Another thing I want to mention is what happens if we delete the label and we add the placeholder, the evil placeholder, and we write name? This is the placeholder is very, very much favored by graphic designers because it's very clean and sleek. You don't need an extra element. It just makes the interface look good. I actually on Twitter, uh, I was on Twitter ages ago because Twitter is trash, but that's another topic. So, and there was this. Um, this uh, web designer who bragged how he removed all the labels from his website and he replaced them with placeholders. And then he he put uh, he put screenshots and people were like, oh, this is so beautiful. It looks way more sleek, minimalism rocks and stuff like that. It might look a little bit prettier, I guess, but it's just very inaccessible because if a screen reader jumps into the label, excuse me, into the input, it's not gonna be able to read the placeholder. Now, there is a caveat, modern screen readers actually can read placeholders. So you probably think, well, if they can read placeholders, why do we bother with labels? Because this is only modern screen readers and they're not all of them, not all of them support placeholder. So it is really, it's not something you can rely on. Another problem with the placeholder is that, see how the, the color of the placeholder is light gray. And usually the background of the placeholder is white. Well, the problem is one of the rules of web accessibility is contrast. See how the heading is blue. It really stands out from the white background. This means that it has very high contrast, but the placeholder is light gray on a white background. So it fails the contrast requirements. This means if you are not using a screen reader, but if you have visual impairments or if you're colorblind, it's kind of very difficult for you to actually see the text. And yes, you can change the text of the placeholder to increase its contrast, but the problem then becomes is that the text, the placeholder looks like actual text, and then people will try to, you know, remove it and place backspace. It, it's just very bad user experience, so don't do that. Another thing I read is that when you have labels, okay, when you have a label and a blank box, people in instinctively want to fill in the, the blank box. So it's with psychology, not really sure, but this looks way better than what it was for. Uh, I think I messed up my marker. Yeah. Okay. So that's it. Um, another thing is place your labels above the place your labels above the inputs. So the, the name should be above it, not next to it. This is uh, very good for for mobile devices and if the user zoom as well. So. That's another thing to, to keep in mind of. Another thing, uh, are there any questions so far? If there are any questions, make sure to type them in the chat and I'll get to them whenever I, whenever I look at the other screen. <laughs> okay. So uh, this, is, uh, this is the basics so far. Now, what happens if you want, let's say for example, that the designer comes to you, did you create a very nice accessible form? The designer comes to you and says, I want those labels out of here. So no labels whatsoever. And then the designer says, no placeholder whatsoever. So I want the label to disappear. But since you are creating an accessible form, you're like, well, I can remove the labels, but I also want to make the designer happy because he's my boss. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use area labeled by, and then I'm going to use say name. And so what we're going to do is we're going to use the area labeled by. This is used to connect an input to a label. Okay, so this is a little bit uh, tricky. What we're going to try is we're going to try to hide this label, but still make it announceable by screen readers. And if we do something like this, it's not going to work playing on, it hides it from screeners and sighted users. If you use a thing visibility none, I think yes, also hides it from screeners and sighted users. 
but it also hides it from the accessibility API. But what you can do as a trick is you can just type hidden and this will hide. Okay. So hidden is a HTML attribute that you can use. I don't know why it's not working here, but if you type hidden as an HTML attribute and then type an ID, let's say name, the label is going to disappear, but the screen readers will still pick it up. So this is one trick you can use to actually hide labels, but still have them present for screen readers. So I don't know why hidden isn't working. I think you have, I think it has something to do with CSS here, but never mind. Now, so one other trick is if you want to hide the label, a lot of people, what they do is they just use area label. What area label does is, is additional information for screen readers that the users don't see. And it is very enticing to use it instead of, an, of a visible label. Because if I say here name, then in theory, the screen readers will be able to pick it up and say, oh, if I, if I jump into the input, the screen readers can say lay, input type text name. Now, the problem with this approach is area label for inputs is not supported. I think only NVDA supports it, but I'm not really sure. I know only one screen reader supports it. So the problem is that with the, in the WCAG, of content accessibility guidelines, they say use area label for inputs. But the problem is a lot of, some of the advice in the web accessibility guidelines is that, web, web content accessibility guidelines, excuse me, is that they, it's not tested on all screen readers. So this actually don't doesn't work. So <laughs> don't use that. <laughs> this is something I had to find out the hard way. Now, let me see if you have any questions. What about hiding the area in CSS but visible to screen readers? Yeah, you can use hidden attribute to hide the label. Um, okay, uh, yes. You can also use the bootstrap class, uh, CR only. So have you guys uh, coded with bootstrap? They have this, oops, they have this class called CR only. So if you have it installed, you can add this as a class to the label and then you hide the label, but screeners still pick it up because it's not actually hidden. There is also, you can also copy and paste the, the class and add it to your code, even if you don't use Bootstrap, like I do, I do that. I don't like Bootstrap. So with CR only, you can hide the label, but it, it will be visible screen readers. And another question is, do all screen readers understand area? No, they, not all of them. So screen readers have various supports for area. Some screen readers understand more area and other screen readers understand less, or some screen readers interpret it in a completely different way than others. So the, the only thing you can do is actually test it yourself because there, there are some resources on the web where they say, okay, so area label is not supported by JAW, so it's not supported by narrator. But most of the time there's very little information. So whenever you create some, whenever you add some area, fire up your screen read and test it and see how it behaves. Why hide the label is another question, but uh, because of design. <laughs> Never hide the label. That's a good question. Never hide the label if you can avoid it because it's much more easier for people to actually see it, you know, when it's visible. <laughs> but sometimes design requirements ask you to hide it. Um, now let's finish coding our, let's, let's finish coding a very simple, okay, so a very simple form. And then I'm going to talk to Required fields because it's just something that it's very difficult. So I'm going to say name, I'm going to say four. Actually, another thing, when it comes to forms, you know the, the rule is to have as little form fields as possible. And this is where marketing clashes because when marketing tries to target users so they can sell them stuff, okay? And that's, that's okay, we have to sell in order to put food on the table. But the problem is, the more you know about the user, the, le the, the easier it is to sell for them. And, but marketing comes to the developers and say, I want like 50 form fields. So I have seen form fields that ask you some weird questions like contact forms that ask you for your address, for your home address, and it's required. So you cannot send them an email unless you provide your address. Now, these forms are not only, not only have more users that bounce from them, they're also inaccessible because people with screen readers it takes the way more form than sighted users because screen readers, they don't always support areas. That's, there's a lot of issues. Also, it depends on how much time a user has used the screen reader. 
So to make your forms accessible, this is a, another secret, is have as little form fields as possible. On my website, in my contact forms, only have two form fields, email and message, and that's it. So I advise you, if you can, if you can make it, just have as little form fields as possible and this can make it accessible and have people with screen readers who in your forms easier. And there are like county studies that say, you know, forms with less fields get filled in more often, of course, because we're all busy. We don't have five hours to fill in a form asking about our first child's name and stuff like that. Okay. And you can use like diffs as well in forms. Diffs don't have any semantic meaning, so I like to use them to format my forms and see the labels above the input. And let's make my, my, my formatting here is really bad. Let me try to fix it up. And then let's, let's type out, this is a text area, yes. Let me see if there are any questions. Michael, I've had a designer that will not allow form fields, form labels, and I'm still fighting with them about this. Yes, Michael. <laughs> I totally agree with you, especially if you, you're working as a full-time employee. Yes, that's right. So you can hide it, but still have it visible for people with screen readers, so. But if you can afford it, not hide it. Okay, and then we are going to have message. And I'm not saying designers are wrong, but don't, don't get me wrong. The problem is designers are, you know, I'm sorry. I, miss, I misspoke. Designers are extremely talented people and they, they can make beautiful interfaces. I can make a beautiful interface. The problem arises when designers are not given accessibility training. So when you have when you have a team, you need to train your copywriters, your designers, your developers in accessibility. This is why you have things like if your developer is like an accessibility guru, but the designer have no idea about accessibility, they're going to make slick interfaces. But for example, the, the contrast is going to be off. There's not going to be any labels. It's not their fault. It's just their training. Okay. And we have text area message. We add an ID of message and the label is going to be or That's pretty much it. Now, see, we have another problem here. The form fields are very much squished together. See how close they are to each other? Because if I open the website on my phone, this is how the website's going to look on my phone. If I miss, if I press my finger very close, see, I'm trying to select the email, but I'm actually selecting the message. So, that means I need to add more spacing between these two. And this is bad because if you have Parkinson's disease or if you have cerebral palsy, then uh, those people's uh, hands, uh, you know, they have tremors on their hands. So if, if uh, interactive elements are too close together, it's gonna make it very difficult for them to select the correct one. And even if, um, even if you're able, how many times have you opened a web form and you're trying to select one thing and then you select another thing? It's, it's, it's quite inaccessible. So spacing is another thing to, to really keep in mind. Make sure you have correct spacing. If, if anything looks too close together, it's, not a, it's, it's just bad usability. I'm just trying to format my code. All right. Um, let me see if I can fix it with my style. I just put... I'm going to add that all of my form fields have div, so I'm just going to add a margin of 10 pixels. Okay. A little bit too close, 15. Okay, that's better. Okay, let me close that up. Now let me add another, another form field, and let's say that it's going to be name. I don't know why it's flagging it. Okay, right. Your IDs must be unique. Also, if your IDs are not unique, a lot of uh, web accessibility automatic testing stuff will flag it because screeners rely on IDs a lot to jump from elements to elements and from headings to headings. Um, okay, I see we have some other questions. I'll come to them in a second. I just want to talk to you guys about required. I'll explain everything. So let me, let me, let's say that we have name. 
for our contact form. And as we talked earlier, you have to make sure that you have as little form field as possible. But, you know, marketing says, no, we need to capture everyone's name so we can track them in the GPS and send them one's list mail. <laughs> And now, but because you're a good developer, you say, okay, so we have to mark which fields are mandatory and which fields are optional. And a lot of people, what they do is they just add a star, okay? And it's usually, they add a star. And there's a couple problems with this approach. The first problem is when the screen reader enters a form field with a star, it's going to say input email star. And then when it goes to the other one, it's going to say message star. Now, screen reader users have no idea what star symbolizes. So especially if they have been born blind, if they've been blind their whole lives, or another group of people, people who are coming online for the first time. There's a lot of people coming online for the first time in the world, more than we think of. So they don't know what star is. They don't know what the star is next to the email means. It's all very confusing for them. So the way to mitigate that is you need to tell them what the star means. And the way you do it is at the beginning of the form or even outside of the form. I usually just add a paragraph saying what the star means. So fields marked with star required. And this helps somewhat, but the problem is if you have this text here, sighted users are going to read fields marked with star are required. The problem is when screen readers read that, they're going to read fields marked with asterisk or they're going to say something else are required. And whenever they, they land, it's going to say email asterisk or message asterisk or message star because not all screen readers pronounce that symbol correctly. So the way to mitigate that is to hide the stars for screen readers, if that makes sense. So in order to hide an element from screen reader, First, we need to enclose it inside another element. So what I do is I enclose my stars in spans. Okay? So I enclose them in spans, and then I use area hidden. What area hidden does is it hides area hidden true thing does. Are you hidden is going to hide this piece of text from screen readers, but it's still going to show it for sighted users. And this is what we want. When screen readers land name, email, and they're not going to announce the star. And this is how, this is part of the journey. Now, but you're probably wondering, okay, Stephanie, if, if, if I'm sighted and I see, okay, fields marked with star required, I see the stars, but screen reader users, if they're blind, they're not going to be able to see the stars. Then how are they supposed to know which fields are required? This is where you add another area to your input. You add area required true. Now, what area required true means is that whenever screen reader user lands on the field, it's going to say email required. And the user, the sighted user will see the star, but the screen reader is going to say required. Another way to do it is to just, if you're using HTML5 form validation, which means having things like required, or pattern, if you're familiar with HTML5 form validation. If you use required, there is no need for area required because screen readers will pick it up and they're going to say required. So this is, um, this is and then you just add it to any form field that are actually required. And the, the other thing is, you can also hide fields marked with star required because we only want this information to be allowed for. To be we only want this information for sighted users because it's going to give them, they're going to benefit from it, okay? There is no need to just spam a text with information screen readers are not going to need because they need to, remember, screen reader users navigate the site slower than sighted ones, so they need the information very fast. And this is, this, this is how you use the star to have it required. And uh, for, for name, you can just say optional. Another way you can mark a field is required is inside the, the star, you can just say parentheses required. And 
this is a good solution, but if you have a lot of form fields and after each and every label, it's going to say required, 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 first it's going to look ugly and it's going to be so much redundant information, people will lose track of the actual label. So this is why I prefer, actually prefer to use, if I only have one input field in a form, I use required, okay? I just use the text, I don't, I don't care. If I have more, I prefer to use the star. Another benefit of the star is, you know how the star is, if you mark it red and then mark it here above red, it's going to be much easier for people to see which fields are required and also helps people with learning disabilities. So don't dismiss the star at all. Use it. Just make sure that screen reader users have an alternative. That's the nice thing about accessibility. When you make an interface accessible, it is good not only for but for able people as well, so everybody benefits. And we just want to say, it's, the, the star is usually marked red. Awesome. And um, if you know, you know that green and red color brightness are the most common, and a lot of people think, oh, I should never use red and green. You can use red and green as much as you like, just have make sure that you have a text alternative for red and green. So if a color blind person sees this star, it's not going to see it's red, but it's still going to see the shape of the star, and it's going to read, they're going to read the, the instructions about it okay so this is how you make it uh, required and you know use are you required or required and then mark the fields as optional or what you can say is if all the fields are actually required you can say you can actually remove the stars or you can leave the stars and then have instructions on the top all fields are required and make sure that you don't hide it from students because they have to know as well a very good way to and the user's like okay so i have to fill in everything yeah makes sense this is a very good accessible form i like it now let me see if there are any other questions okay so what he asks please explain the difference between tab index zero and tab index one with an example okay this is um if i have time i'll explain that uh, okay um i think i have time to explain tab index zero or tab index minus one So with tap index, every interactive element has tap index by itself. And the tap index is what allows people to focus. Whenever you're using a website with a screen reader, you need to be able to focus interactive elements. So these interactive elements have tap index by itself. But let's say I want to focus this field over here. I can. If right now I'm on my contact form, if I press tab, the first element that gets focused is the email because the email is interactive. But what? But if I want to focus all fields for required text, what I can do is I can just go inside the paragraph and type tap index zero. This will make the text focusable. Now look, I'm inside my form, I'm pressing tab, and the form fields are required text is focused only because I added tap index one. So, and some people think that in order to make the text readable by screeners, they need to have tap index in order to focus. That's not true. Screeners will read the text without tap index. You only use tap index if you want to make the, make the text interactive. But don't use it very often because a lot of screeners will say, for example, they will, whenever they have tap index zero, they will say clickable. And then users will try to click it with the space bar or enter and it's just bad user experience. So use this apparently. But if I have it minus one, see what happens. I'm inside my form and I press I press tab and the email. So this is not focused, but I can focus it via JavaScript, okay? So this is used if you want to make interactive um, focus, if you want to use the roving tap index as well. I don't know if you guys have heard of the roving tap index. It's where you make uh, an interface focusable by using the arrow keys, and then you dynamically disable the tap index from zero to one. But in layman's term, tap index minus one allows you to make a, a field focusable via JavaScript. If the field is not focusable at all, if it's just a paragraph, it's not focusable by default, you cannot focus it with JavaScript. So that's what the difference is. Now, tap index minus one, you, you can get focused only with JavaScript. You cannot have it focused by just using the tab. So it, it's, it's a bit more complicated example. You can use the JavaScript focus with that. So you can say, let's say that I have the ID of Sarah. 
and then I can I can do if, if I'm writing in JavaScript I can do para focus so and it, it will focus it only via JavaScript it, it's useful when you're doing the roving tab index can you explain this with the drop I don't think I'll have time to explain with the drop down drop downs don't usually require tab index Okay, um, I'm going to, let's look at some examples. I have prepared some examples to look for bad forms. This is a, a form for checkout. And um, who can what's wrong with this form? I'm going to wait one minute. Look, look at it deep, look at it very carefully. It's a form that we see a million times when we're buying slippers, because I buy a lot of slippers on the internet. Don't ask me why. <laughs> yeah, it's, um, so, What's wrong with this form is the form fields don't have any labels. They're using placeholders. And what's worse is that the text of the placeholders is very tiny. So this is very bad for readability. And they also have hints, but they're all in placeholders. So, you know, the problem is with placeholders that screeners will not be able, will not be able to read it. It's bad for, for people with color blindness or vision loss. And the other problem is that it's not correctly labeled. So whenever you have a bunch of fields, if we have a bunch of um, form fields, let's say that email and message is part of a larger form. Let's say that email and message are part of a big checkout form. You know, they, they, they have a lot of forms. What you gotta do there is use the field set. Use the field set element And the field set element, see how by default it creates a border and it's used to separate big forms into smaller chunks. And with the field set element, you also use the legend. And legend is like a hint about what type of input is required. So, for example, maybe we have personal information. Okay. So, if you have like a huge form and suddenly you ask for the email, people with screeners would be like, okay, so. I am filling in this questionnaire about the ducks and suddenly I'm asked for my email. Why is that? Well, if they suddenly enter inside the email, the screen is going to say input email and then it's going to say personal information. Okay, I understand they need my personal information. And the field set is also very used for if you need, if you have like a bunch of radio buttons or a bunch of check boxes, but this is for advanced advanced forms. We can look at it later. Okay. Um, I think our time is almost up. I'm, I'm going to switch to my screen now. Lecture has ended.